a rock. Amen. Does everybody have a rock? If you don't have a rock, you need a rock in your hand. I got my rock. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The title of my sermon today is Stop Throwing Stones and Forgive. Stop throwing rocks and forgive. Stop throwing stones and forgive. And I want to read this scripture and then I will pray. Amen. In St. John, the eighth chapter, everybody got a rock? Let me see your rock. Don't be scared to raise that rock today because this rock is twofold today. It's a rock of offenses and grievances that you may have had with your father. But I want to tell you today that forgiveness is going to flood the house today. I believe that God is about to restore some relationships. So if the thought of your earthly father is one of great pain, I want you to know today that God has grace for you. Hallelujah. Some of you don't know your father. Some of you may have never seen your father. Maybe your father was not active in your life. But I want you to hold this stone up. And I want you to remember today that I don't have to throw a rock at my daddy, but I can forgive him. Amen. Let me read this verse to you in St. John, the eighth chapter. If you will turn with me, if you have your Bibles, St. John 8, verse number 7. It says, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. He that is without sin, let him cast a stone at her. Now let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus today that you would bless every person standing here today. Father, I ask in the mighty name of Jesus that restoration would come to the people of God today. I pray over whole households today that you would bring fathers and their children back together again. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, even those that may not know their father, that their father may be gone such as mine, but that you, Lord God, would comfort every heart. Oh, Father, I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, that you would speak to us in Jesus' mighty name, and you all may be seated. Amen. Now, I want you, how many of y'all want to be active today in the sermon and I want you to turn to your neighbor and look at your neighbor uh, holding your rock. Amen. Because you're going to remember this rock. Amen. But turn to your neighbor. And I want you to say this. Hatred, resentment, and anger have no place in my relationship with my father. It doesn't have any place. So for some people, not all, thoughts of their earthly father is one of great uh, pain, but there is grace today. And I've learned that whether you are a young child or an old child, that there are many children carrying offenses and grievances against their father, whether they are alive or deceased. Amen. Amen. Your father could be deceased and you still mad at him. You're angry for uh, maybe things that, something that he did years ago, or maybe something he should have did but he never did, or maybe something that he's currently doing that you don't like. But fathers should be kings of their household. Fathers need to be honored and recognized for the strength that God has given to them to lead the family. Now, this story that I have you at in St. John, the eighth chapter, was about a female and a man 
the Pharisees and the scribes, they caught this woman in the act of adultery. And so they dragged her out before the crowd. And the scripture says that she was caught in the very act. So they have caught her, but I noticed something. They dragged her out, and uh, by law, the Levitical law in Leviticus uh, 20 and 10, it talks about if a man or woman is caught in adultery, how that they were both to be stoned to death. Amen. So I looked at this, and I said, isn't this interesting? They only dragged the woman out but not the man. It's where we have men being ignored and absent fathers and different things. But I said, wait a minute. It takes two to commit adultery. And the law said that both of them should be put to death. But Jesus is standing there with them, and he begins to stoop down in the ground. Now, theologians said all kind of stuff of what he wrote, but they don't know what he wrote because the scripture doesn't tell us. Amen. So let's not input something that is really not there. But what I see is that the man was left without being held accountable. And this is what is happening with children all over the world, that fathers are not owning up to their responsibility, and they're not held accountable for the seed that they have produced. So Jesus looks at this crowd, and they want to trip him up, and he says to them, in other words, if I can paraphrase it, Whoever is out here in this crowd right now without any sin, go on and throw your rock. While you want to stand and still be angry at your father for what he should have, could have, or would have, or did not do, are you without sin yourself that you could stand there and literally throw that rock at him? Now, I, I just, for the sake of when I was studying, I went and I looked at Stony, and it's the most gruesomest kind of death that you are standing and people begin to pulverize you with rocks, breaking your skin. It's just a hideous way to die. But many of us have killed our relationship with our fathers and grandfathers because of something that went wrong. Are you sinless? Can you really throw your rock at daddy? We don't take in consideration ourselves. But today I want you to know that you need to forgive. And if you don't get anything out the message today, this one thing I want you to get out of today is that you need to forgive your father and your grandfather or whoever it is that was a guardian in your life that you are holding offense or grievances toward for whatever reason it may be. And I want to tell you today that forgiveness has nothing to do with how you feel and your emotions. Forgiveness is an act of will. Forgiveness is an act of obedience unto God because God said that we should forgive those that trespass against us. Amen. Now, stop, if I can say it like this, seeking revenge. So, well, how I'm seeking revenge with my dad, whatever. Well, you're seeking revenge because you walk around angry, bitter. You probably talk about them. And how about this? You may not even communicate with them at all. You're seeking revenge through those actions instead of resolutions. And God wants us to resolve things. I want to tell you a little story today, and then I'm going to, I want to look at today two types of fathers, a bad father and a good father. Can we do that? The scripture shows us a bad father, and he shows us as well a good father. And I want you to ask yourself the question as you're sitting there right now, which type of father are you? Now, Ernest Hemingway is a writer, and he wrote a story, and he called it uh, the capital of the world. But 
in this story, there was this young boy who had did some things wrong and he got in trouble with his father and he mistreated his father and did a wrong. So he ran away because of the shame. So he left and his father wanted his son back. And it says, all over Spain, this father went looking for his son. His son's name was Paco, and he could not find his son. So on the last attempt, it says, he went to the city of Madrid in a last desperate attempt to find his son. Because how many of you know that real fathers search out for their kids? And it says that he searched and he searched. So he finally got to Madrid and he said, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put an ad in the newspaper. And when I put this ad, I'm going to just put this statement. Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana, noon Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. So the daddy was hoping in a desperate attempt that Paco would see this news ad. Well, on Tuesday, the father went on to Hotel Montana. And when he arrived, to his surprise, he saw over 800 young boys in front of the Hotel Montana. And he saw the police, like, trying to get order. And so he ran up to the police, and he said, well, what's going on here? He said, well, these 800 boys, all name is Paco, and they looking for forgiveness from their daddy. Good God Almighty, how many kids are seeking in desperation for forgiveness from their fathers? There is such a need for fathers in the lives of their children. Listen to me. When you, when you experience bad parenting from a parent, it produces broken children. And then broken children wind up in places they should not be. But I want to show you something. That our Father God is still looking for his wayward child. Just as that daddy went to Hotel Montana, God is waiting for you. He's waiting for you to come back to him. Because we all need our Heavenly Father. Now, you may say, what? That many people? That many boys? Yes. There's a lot of prodigal kids out there in the world that our Heavenly Father is searching for. Now, I want you to go over with me because I said I want us to look at today. And I want you to have in your heart today, God, I need you to root up anything inside of my heart that I may have toward my father. It doesn't matter whether your father is dead or alive. My father is gone. But I thank God my father provided for me. I had a good father. I didn't say I had a perfect father. I said I had a good father. That means that he made mistakes. And we have to be able to allow uh, our father's mistakes. Amen. And many of you are so stringent, you don't give them a break. Amen. But how many of you know you need to? Now go with me, and I want to show you a bad father. Can we, y'all know, can we roll in the scriptures for a little while? Let's go to 2 Samuel, the 13th chapter. 2 Samuel 13, go to verse number 12. Now, I want to show you some things here in the scriptures. 2 Samuel 13, verse number 12. I'm going to read down to 14, and then I'm going to drop down a little bit further. It said, and she answered him, nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly, and I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? As for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Now, here we have a family. We have uh, a sister, her name is Tamar. We have a brother whose name is Amnon. 
And then we have an older brother whose name is Absalom. I just brought you into the middle of the situation where Amnon, her brother, rapes his sister. Now, the sister says, well, I'm going to take my shame. What am I going to do with this? Because now she would no longer be considered a virgin, and she would not have a chance now for marriage. So she's telling her brother, don't do this thing to me. Go talk to daddy, who is David, who is the king, and maybe he'll give me to you. But the brother being stronger than her went on and forced himself on her. Let's continue. Drop down to verse 20. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Have Amnon, thy brother, been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard all these things, he was very wroth. Verse 23. This is, this is the kicker right here. And it came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shears in Baal Hazar, which is beside Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. Now, wait a minute. If I'm not mistaken here, <laughs> David finds out that his son has raped his daughter. I'm talking about some bad parenting here. Now listen here, fathers, you might be a good provider, but if you can't handle problems and issues and circumstances in your house, that doesn't make you a good daddy. Amen. Because your house, your family comes before that provision. I said, wait, wait, wait. Why? Because you produce that seed. And it says that Amnon has now raped his sister Tamar. David finds out who is the king. Can you imagine? He's a king. Not only that, it says that David was a warrior. In other words, David was a fighter. But yet, he was weak in his parenting skills. How many strong daddies do we have? But they can't sit down for a minute and talk with their kid. How many big, strong fathers do we have? But they can't take 20 minutes and just take the child for ice cream. The Sunday's Wisdom said when the father wrote his entry into his diary, he said, I went fishing with my son and it was a day wasted because he was the president and he had so many other things he thought he could have been doing. But his son wrote in his diary the same situation, the same day, and said it was the best day of my life. Fathers, you got to understand that you spending time with your children is providing some of the best times of their life. They don't want just things from you. You can provide them with gifts, but how about this? They'd rather have you than a gift. You are their gift. Every father is a gift to a child. Every child should be able to look up to their father and honor their father. The Bible says, uh, one of the commandments, it says, honor your mother and your father so that your days can be long on the earth. A lot of kids' lives are being shut down because they are not honoring their mothers and their fathers. When you're young, you think, oh, wow, my dad is the king. My dad knows everything. But then when you start getting in them teenage, he know a little something, something. Then by the time you hit 20 or 30, he don't know nothing. He old school. But by the time you hit 40, you say, let me go (laughs) and seek some wisdom from my daddy. See, how you view things and how you look at your father is so important. Turn to your neighbor and say, your daddy doesn't have to be perfect, but he does have to love you. He doesn't have to be perfect to love you. (laughs) We want perfect daddies. But let me see your stone. Because if you feel like you can toss it at your daddy, (laughs) Jesus said back there, he said, (laughs) he that be without sin. He said, go cast the first stone. The rest of the story said, from the eldest to the youngest, walked away. 
because they recognized that they too were imperfect. And guess what? Jesus told her, and this is just like a good father. Jesus said to her, he said, in other words, get up, daughter. He said, now go and sin no more. The Heavenly Father is talking to some of you right now that you need to rise up and go and sin no more. Come up out of that place and receive the abundance of love and grace that he has for your life. So let's keep going here. In verse number 23, it says, Two full years went by, and David did not deal with Amnon raping his sister, Tamar. And so now we see the dynamics of a dysfunctional family starting to take root. Because Absalom now is very angry. He's the older brother. Most older siblings want to protect the younger ones. So now Absalom is very angry, bitter, and resentful that his daddy, who is the king, has not addressed the issue of Amnon, his brother, raping his sister. How many times in your family has a situation or a circumstance went down and you let mama take care of it instead of daddy? Most fathers say, oh, woman, you go take care of it. But how many of you know it's a lot more weight and it's a lot more pull when that father steps into position and when that father handles the deal? Sister, step back and let daddy handle it. You know, we handle it because we know what to do. <laughs> but God created that man as the head of the household for a reason. And God has given them the wisdom and the know-how, the knowledge and the strength to lead. I want to throw this in there as a sidebar. Any father that loves God can surely love his wife and his kids. When you have a man that loves God and can worship God, he can take good care of you. Oh, come on. It's the truth. So let's keep going. So now we see Absalom is angry. Drop down with me to verse number 28, if you will. And it says, now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. And when I say unto you, smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not. Have not I commanded you, be courageous and be valiant. And the servants of Absalom did unto Abnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's son arose, and every man got him up upon his mule and fled. Now let's keep going just a little bit. I want to read 38 and 39. It says, so Absalom fled, went to Geshur, and was there three years. And the soul of King David longed to go for Absalom, for he was comforted, Amnon, seeing he was dead. Wait, wait, wait. So now what we, what we see, say it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. So Absalom has so much resentment and grievance and offense against his father for not doing justice for his sister that Absalom decides to take matters into his own hands. Oh, how twisted households become when the kid begins to give instruction to the parent. When the kid starts running the household instead of the parent, it's twisted. The Bible said that parents are supposed to lay up for the child, not the child for the parent. And we have many kids running households. Can somebody please explain to me how a three-year-old can run a 30-year-old? I want somebody to talk to me today about that. The three-year-old is running you and you 30. The three-year-old hadn't even been in existence long enough to understand what life is. And this is what you say. I want them to express themselves. One teacher told me that because parents are allowing their kids to express themselves, they said they came to school with one shoe on, one boot on, a uh, polka dot shorts, and a striped shirt, and she was looking at the child, and it was like, what's going on here, the teacher says. And she said, oh, that's what she wanted to wear today. 
Fathers and mothers, get involved in your children's lives and understand that they're not at that level of maturity to make some of the decisions that you want them to make. I want you to understand today that children are a blessing and not an inconvenience. And anytime you start feeling your child is an inconvenience, you will start allowing them to do the things that you should be doing for them. But children are a blessing. So we see here the dysfunction from a father, King David, failing to address a family issue. He didn't, he, it says he got mad about it, but he just didn't do nothing about it. See, fathers get mad, they may leave the house or go, they may drink, they may smoke, they may do whatever it is to soothe that anger, but he did not address the issue with the family. Amnon should have been addressed and disciplined. Uh-oh, oh, oh, I got I to gotta go there. He didn't discipline his son. The Bible says if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. So when fathers don't step in and discipline their children, their children are able or will begin to stray. So now Absalom says, since my daddy is not going to take care of things, and now he's resentful, and he's not talking to his daddy, Amnon not talking, so now we see a breakdown in communication. How many families do we have where the siblings or the children are not communicating with their parents. They've been estranged from parents for five, six, seven, eight years. I haven't talked to my daddy in 10 years because of so-and-so. So So now we see how the enemy has allowed a lack of communication to enter into households. Now, Amnon now is dead. Absalom, the other son, (laughs) He got three kids right here. He got more kids. But let's just look at this. Because this father, who had poor fathering skills, didn't address the issue from the beginning. Up, oh, listen to what the Lord just said. Stop letting issues in your family fester. Nip it in the bud immediately. Address it quickly. Bring God in on the scene. So now King David has one son that is dead, Amnon. He has another son, Absalom, who is now a murderer, and he's on the run. He ran, (laughs) and it says he stayed away for three years, so it was two years uh, time span. Now we're up to five years on one issue that has not been addressed. And look at the dysfunction that has spewed all through the family. I want to tell you something, too. When I read that... It says that, um, Absalom, I want to show you something because go down to verse number, let's see if I can find it because I found something so interesting as I was studying. Absalom, the son, in 2 Samuel 15, he starts a conspiracy against his daddy. So when you have bitterness and resentment in your heart, you will literally start rising up against your parents. And you know, in the old day, we used to say, you you smelling yourself, you stepping out of line now. This is when children began to rise up and disrespectfully speak to their parents. But the Bible says we need to honor our mothers and our fathers at all times. I don't see anywhere in Exodus 20 where it says honor mothers and fathers that it said that they had to be a good parent. So while you said they they deserve to be talked like this because they didn't do this, that, and the other. But the Bible does not say that. The Bible simply says, honor your mother and your father that your days will be long upon the earth. So now we see a few things from a bad father. is neglect to correct or discipline their child. And then we also see that fathers, when you don't deal with issues, they will grow. Any undealt with issue in your life will grow. 
This is not just with a father. This is any issue. Whatever you don't confront, you cannot overcome. You have to be able to deal with things. So now, in let's go over to 2 Samuel 15. I want us to see this in the word. 2 Samuel 15, and go to verse number 4. When your kids see how you handle things, they will follow and do the same. When your kids see how you respond to stuff, they will do the same. So while you're saying, uh, I don't know why this child is acting this way. Well, what have they seen you do? Because they watch everything you do. You may not think that they're watching you, but they are watching you. And when they get their families, they will do the exact same thing that they saw done in their household. I told a story to my Sunday school class about three, three daughters, a mother, a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter, three generations. And at the holiday, grandmother with her big old whole ham would cut a whole half of it off and put it in her pan and bake this beautiful ham. And so the grandmother now has turned it over. The mother does it. The mother does the same thing. She cuts half of the ham off, throws it in the garbage, and bakes the ham. Finally, it gets to the granddaughter. I'm just talking to you about what you do is very important for what your child will see. So the granddaughter finally got up enough nerves because grandmama did it, mama did it, and the granddaughter said, Grandma, why are we cutting off half of the ham and throwing it away? She said, oh, baby, I did that because I didn't have a big enough pot to fit it in. Y'all got a big enough pot. You don't have to do that. Wasted ham, lack of communication, and it followed from generation to generation. What are you doing that your child is following? So now in verse number four, let's look at this. Absalom said, moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which had any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. Now look at this. And he says, and it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And verse 6, and on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Here we have a king with a son that has now rose up against him and started a conspiracy. So now, you know what he said in verse 4? He said, you come on to me because I'm going to do justice. Where did that come from? You know where it came from? Because David, King David, did not deal with Amnon and Tamar's situation, and Absalom felt no justice was done. So he said, guess what? I'm going to get all the people following David to come and follow me because I'm going to show them what justice really is. Be careful when you don't handle your business. Undealt with problems, undealt with problems will grow. So now... If we go a little further in the story, and I exhort you to go back and read it because it's just a fascinating story of family. And so Absalom has this conspiracy. The people don't got on his side pulling him from his dad. And they say, listen, Absalom is coming for us. And so David runs from his son. How does a parent run from their kid. 
We got fathers that are full of shame and anguish. And so you know what they do? They run from their kids. They won't come at home at night. They'll go out and stay with buddies all night long just to not have to face that child because they know that they hadn't done right by him. But daddy, I want to talk to you today. Go home, daddy. Go home to your children. Go home. So you messed up. They got to forgive. Children, forgive your fathers. Children, let daddy go. Children, drop your rock. You're sitting there right now. The Holy Ghost is bringing some stuff up to your heart. You need to drop your rock. You've been holding that rock for 15, 20 years over on daddy. Drop it. Drop your rock. You have no, you, you have no right to keep holding that rock at daddy. I know he messed up, but forgive him. Forgive your father, whether he is dead or alive, whether he did a good job or not, you made it. You know why you made it? Because you're here today. You made it. Give daddy a break. So I looked at it, and it says that Absalom had this conspiracy against his father, and now Absalom and all his men is coming after David. But it says that King David packed up and said, let's get going. I'm just going to paraphrase it to you. And so David now is on the run, and he leaves back about 10 of his other concubine wives. Absalom comes into town. And I said, well, this is real bad that David is running from his kid and David is a warrior. So I saw two sides to this story because David is a warrior. It may be the reason the scriptures declare that he didn't want the city of Jerusalem to be tore up. Uh Uh-oh, wait, this is good. When your family has a dysfunction in it, it does not only just affect you, but it affects the people that you and your kids know. So now you don't brought a whole bunch of other people into your problem and it festers and it grows more and more. So David knew that Absalom was mad. And if he would have came up on David, because David is a man of war, they would have told Jerusalem up. But now I realize that David, even in his mistakes, he had wisdom. Because the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. You mean to tell me that a godly daddy can still make mistakes? Yes. You mean to tell me that a daddy that go to church every Sunday can still do some wrong? Yes. But God still loves him. And so should you. And I realized that the reason that David ran was because he loved his son. And he knew that if they would have broke out in that fight, his son may have been killed. And he didn't want that to happen. And neither did he want other people's lives to be messed up because he didn't do the right thing. Fathers, you are the king of your home. Fathers, go home. I want to tell you something, and we're going to move now to what a good father looks like. But I want to say that half-hearted parenting is very difficult. When you you are a parent and you really don't know if you really want to be a parent, you can't put your all into it. And turn to somebody and say, the kids suffer. Half-hearted parents cause kids to suffer. Well, what you talking about half-hearted? I'm talking about the parents that is, that's very selfish, that is always about them and not the child. Once you have a child, listen, your life changes forever. Once you have a child, you have somebody else dependent upon you. But selfish parents will only worry about themselves. They won't care what the child is going through. They won't sit down and see to it that the child is taken care of because they're half-hearted. They're more concerned about themselves than the child. Parents, fathers, take time with your children. Love on them. 
Because I don't know about you, every kid needs their daddy. I was 39 when I lost my daddy. And I said, I'm too young for my daddy to leave me. I said, I'm too young. Wait a minute. I got some more stuff I need to talk to him about. And here we have people that have fathers and they don't see their dads. They don't go to their dad. Bishop going to get me. I said, go see your daddy. Go see your parents. Because you have them. Because you have them. I would give anything to have them back. Anything. And I can remember. I can remember being there. And I, I prayed to God. And I don't know, Sister Diane Mike can remember this. But I, I prayed, and I remember I said, I'm going to go to the hospital, and I'm going to pray all night, and my daddy is going to live. I just declared it so. And I think Sister Diane came by to see me, and she prayed with me. Do you remember that? And we prayed in tongues, and we wailed over him. And we did, oh, my God. I don't think I slept all that night. Said, 39, too young, he can't go yet. But he passed broke me. Never felt a pain like that ever before in my life. This gigantic hole was sitting in my heart. <laughs> and you have your daddy? And you don't want to honor and love him? You don't want to respect him because he's not perfect? You have your father. But then... My heavenly father swooped in, scooped up the pain in my heart, and let me know, you got to keep going. See, there's a heavenly father that is greater than your earthly father that can take care of you and every need that you have. You have a heavenly father that is resourceful. He is wise. He is faithful. He is dependable. And all he needs is for his sons and his daughters to call upon his name. He said, when you call upon me, I'll be there. He said, even before you call sometime, I will be there. What kind of God is this that will answer me before I speak? And then I thank God. I can remember I was crying. And Pa Wellington said to me, and I don't even know if he remembered it, he said, as long as I'm alive, you're going to always have a daddy. And when he said that to me, he don't know it did walls for me because then I realized I was not uncovered. Fathers cover their families. Fathers protect their families. Good fathers. Now, do you have your rock? I want you to hold the rock up because we need to take some action today. And you can get it later. Forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is not based on how you feel. Now, we have two beautiful examples of this. In Luke 23 and 34, we have, y'all tired of holding y'all rock up? Or what? You've been mad at daddy for 20 years, and you can't hold your rock for two minutes? What's going on out there? Come on now. Put that rock up. Jesus said in Luke 23 and 34, they were crucifying him. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I want you to say that. My daddy didn't know that he hurt me. Come on. If, if it applies to you, my daddy didn't know how bad he hurt me. 
He heard me. Come on, I feel the spirit of the Lord moving around the place right now. Then we have Stephen. Stephen was another great example. He said, Father, receive my spirit and lay not this sin on their charge. And they stoned him. I want you to say right now, I forgive my father and I will not lay the sin that he has committed against me to his charge. Now drop your rock. Woo, hata baba hata. Come on, give the Holy Ghost a shout and a praise. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but it's breaking off of some of you right now. You drop that rock. You drop that offense. You drop that grievance. Let daddy go. Let daddy go. It's a supernatural move. It's a supernatural move. Forgiving has nothing to do with how you feel or what he did. You make a decision out of obedience to forgive and to let your daddy go. Let him go and love on him. Now, I want to tell you about a good father, and I'm going to be wrapping it up. Go with me to the book of Luke. Thank you, Lord. For healing hearts right now. Thank you, Lord, for breaking the rock of offense and grievances right now. Oh, I still feel them. Hallelujah. Somebody might need to talk to them just where you're sitting at. Let them talk to you. Heal that wound in their heart. Somebody's body is about to get healed uh, just from forgiving your father. You have been doing some things that you needed not do. Stop it right now. You don't have to drink anymore. You don't have to get high anymore. You just had to forgive daddy. She was hurting. She was hurting real bad. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's give the Holy Spirit just a little time. See, one thing about the Heavenly Father, his love is constant and it's sure. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Luke 15, go to verse 20. This is the prodigal son that it took, went to his dad, asked for his share of his living. I'm really fascinated by kids that go to their parents and believe they owe them what the parent has worked for. It fascinates me because they feel they're entitled to get it, even though they didn't work for it. So the son knew his daddy was going to leave some things, and the younger son says, Daddy, give me my share. And it says that the son went out and he partied and he blew all his money, (laughs) and then he found himself in a pig's pen. And his father had money and wealth. And then it says he came to his right mind. And this is where we pick up with this son. And this is a good father. I want to give you some characteristics of a good father. In 20, it says, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servant, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry." He said in 24, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to make merry and be merry. Now, what characteristics of a good father? I want to show you the first one. It said that the father saw the son from afar off. That lets me know that daddy, father, or father was looking for his son's return. He didn't know when his son was coming back, but he knew his son was coming back. A good father will never give up on their kid. I don't care what your kid does. Don't give up on your child. The next thing I saw, 
is that when the sun came up on him, there had to be enough open communication because the son says to the father, I'm not even worthy to be your son. I took the money you gave me. Look, I squandered it. I lost it. But check this out. I didn't hear daddy scold him at that moment. It's not always good to scold. Sometimes you just got to love them through it. And it may be difficult, but his father didn't scold him about all the money he wasted. He just loved on him because he returned. The next thing we see of a good father is that he gave him gifts. He said, wait a minute. Put a ring on his finger. Shoes on his feet. Ah, the heavenly father wants to put a ring on your finger. He want to give you some new clothes. He want to prepare a banquet in the presence of your enemy. Your heavenly father wants to do some things for you that you have no idea. Listen to this. He said, your heavenly father wants to bless you so much, he will blow your mind. What God has in store for us, we can't even contain it. We think we know what he wants to give us because, oh, he give us a little house, a little car, a little money in the bank. But God has so much more that he wants to give you. A good father is a provider. A good father is a protector. A good father is a teacher and a friend. A good father leads by example and not by authority all the time. I don't know about y'all, but daddy's that rude with authority. Look, daddy just had to look at us away, and we knew. You knew. He didn't even have to, like. Sometimes you got to be gentle. A good father spends quality time with his children. And can I tell y'all something about this father? Because. In this story around the end of the verse in 31, it talks about how the eldest son was upset that daddy had actually threw a party for a brother that had went out and blew his money. But the father, a good father, has wisdom and knows how to talk to not one of his kids, but all of his kids, though they may all be different. Stop trying to treat all your kids the same because they're not. But you must treat them fairly, but you can't handle them all the same way because they're different. And it says that the father went to the elder son who was angry and not rejoicing over his brother coming home. And he says, son, elder son, like, what what is this, daddy? I've been here working with you all this time. And he done went and blew his living. And the daddy looks him square in the eye and says, son, Everything I have is yours. Do we understand that we can live under an open heaven? That everything that our heavenly father has can be bestowed unto us? We got to come to our heavenly father. Good fathers, I want to thank you. I want to thank every good father in this place for being a provider and a protector. And I want you to know that your job is not in vain. You have produced good seed. You say, well, what happens when I'm a, been a good father and I still produce a bad seed? Well, that's when you got to take in consideration that that person is an individual and has their own mind and can make their own choices. But it wasn't because you didn't do what was right. Now, I want to conclude Because sometimes parents need to know where their kids are. You know, you know your kids, you know your father, you know your parents. I want to tell you this story in conclusion. There was this young man. He was pampered by this rich dad. And his father gave him everything he wanted So this son was getting ready to graduate, and he went to this 
uh, auto store. And he saw this sports car on the showroom floor. And the son said, I want that for my graduation. So what he did was he went home to his daddy and he started throwing his daddy's hints about the sports car so that his daddy would not be mistaken of which sports car it was that he wanted. So finally, graduation day came and his father called him into his study and asked him to sit down. The father got up and bought this beautifully wrapped box and the father gave the gift to the son and said, son, I am so proud of you. You are such a fine son, and I love you. The young man opened the box, happily hoping to see the sports car keys inside. But when he opened the box, there was a book. He got very disappointed and angry, and he looked at the book, and he raised his voice at his father, and he said, all that money you have, Daddy, and all you've given me is this book for my graduation. And it says he stormed out the house, left, and never came back again. He didn't even give his daddy an opportunity to speak. So many years had passed by. And the young man received a telegram saying that your father has passed away and he has willed everything to you. He had not seen his daddy since his graduation day. So the son arrives at the house, sad and with much regret, filled in his heart. And he went into the study. And there in the study was that box, that book, sitting right there all that time. So he goes over and he picks up the book and by now tears are rolling down his eyes and he hadn't seen his daddy and he opened up the book and he turned some pages and he turned a few more pages and there he found a hole in the book. In the hole in the book, was the keys to the sports car that he had wanted. It had a tag on it. It said, with love to my precious son, who has made me so proud. This young man, through his own selfishness, dishonored his father never came back, lost communication. I exhort you, don't lose communication with your father. He sat there. He could not undo time. And the very thing he wanted was there. Sometimes, kids, you got to look at yourself. I'm talking to some adult kids right now. Don't take your parents for granted. Be careful when you feel you're not getting what you want, but it's really what you need. I believe that happened for a reason to show the son just where he was. Daddy is just to give to me, give to me, give to me. But we need to build relationships. And I exhort every one of you today to build a relationship with your Heavenly Father. He doesn't have to hide anything from you. And if you're in need, God will provide for you. Let's just bow our heads. Dear gracious and Heavenly Father, I pray that today relationships are restored. I declare it from this day forward that Father, children will return to their parents and parents will return, especially fathers, to their children. And Father, I ask that you would give them the wisdom and the know-how to lead their families. I thank you, God, for every father. It takes a special kind of man to stand up
and take responsibility for what is his. So, Father, I want to thank you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Ah, shakara borosia.